Uh, OK. Let x be an infinite graph of bounded max degree. I always wanted to start a talk like that. Uh, here's an infinite graph. Of course, this is a finite graph, but like you should imagine it extends in the natural way. So I'll, draw you, I'll show you a bunch of infinite graphs, uh, pieces of infinite graphs. So this is the Cayley graph of some free group. Uh, here's another one. This is a picture of the infinite three regular tree, which I'll denote t sub three. Uh, that's the infinite four regular tree. This is the infinite uh, bi regular tree with degrees three and four. Again, a piece of it. I just put it up so that like, not every graph will be regular. Uh, this is some other Cayley graph of a, of a free group. Uh, that's another one. It's like three cycles, or three, four cycles, like attached indefinitely. Yeah, it's two cycles, yeah, four cycles. Uh, Ah, up until this one. This is a new one. It's not the first. The first one is not a free product of cyclic groups. Actually, this so this graph this is like k4 minus an edge, and then here you attach like another k4 minus an edge, and at the four corners, and so on. Uh, but in this like opposite way. So this is a five regular graph. I don't think it's a free product of uh, groups, but it's the additive product, which is a graph product I think we invented, of these two little graphs. I'll tell you about that later. Uh, this is another example. It's like an irregular infinite graph, just like a bunch of triangles string together in a line, string together in a line. It's the additive product of these two graphs. OK, well, I just want to show you my PowerPoint slides making ability. So that's my infinite graphs. So what are we going to do? So uh, let's fix an infinite graph x. And let this set finite quotients, I guess, of x be all the finite graphs that are quote unquote covered by x. That means uh, x, an infinite graph, covers a finite graph g, or g is a quotient of x. I won't formally define it, but basically means there's like a graph homomorphism from the big graph x into the smaller graph g, a surjection. And that's also like a local bijection. So it preserves the neighborhood structure of all the vertices. Um, informally, I'm just going to say that g like locally resembles x. g is always going to be the small graph, and x is going to be the infinite graph. Uh, so here's this infinite graph x, which is like a triangle and like a couple of edges attached to each vertex, and then a triangle and so forth. And this is an example of a finite graph G, which is covered by this graph. Uh, I think, actually, I didn't prove this, but I think this is true. Like the finite quotients of this infinite graph are all the four regular graphs where every vertex participates in a three cycle. I think that's right. Uh, OK, so that's true of this graph. Uh, Uh, yeah, is that, uh, three that's three regular, yeah. This is, uh, yeah, this is a slightly more complicated than necessary example, but, uh, I agree. And even there, sometimes it's a pain. <laughs> yeah. Even when it is a, yeah, if it's like, Yeah. Yeah. So we'll be considering f um, uh, infinite graphs that are like pretty nice, uh, similar to free products of simple in the colloquial sense groups or graphs. Uh, okay. So this graph actually being four regular, it's also covered by this infinite graph, T4, the infinite four regular tree. In fact, the finite quotients of this infinite four regular tree are just all the four regular graphs. But this particular four regular graph has a special structure, like all the vertices are contained in triangles, and that means, in particular, it's, it's covered by this previous graph. OK. Here we go. Good. Uh, so here's a fact. If you look at all the finite graphs covered by a particular uh, infinite graph x, they have the same largest eigenvalue, lambda 1 of g. OK, and this is my notation for the eigenvalues of the adjacency matrix of g. You just order them in descending order. And in particular, if this x, the big graph, is delta regular for some delta, this common value of the largest eigenvalue is just delta. And that's like the most popular case. And sometimes it's called the trivial eigenvalue. So what we're going to be interested in is not lambda 1, but how small lambda 2 can be, lambda 2 of g, among all the finite graphs g and the finite quotients of a fixed big x. And why are we interested in lambda 2? 
Well, there's a certain sense in which like the gap, uh, how far lambda 2 of g is from lambda 1 of g, uh, there's a certain sense in which it measures how good an expander graph g is. Um, so we'll just take that as our motivation and then decide we want to study uh, the second eigenvalue. If you're really into eigen, uh, you know, the expansion, you might also worry about like, how close the magnitude of the smallest eigenvalue is to lambda 1 of g. Uh, but then if you worry about that, you can't consider bipartite graphs. So let's just not worry about this. I'm just going to focus only on lambda 2 being small compared to lambda 1. So what we really want uh, in this, this talk is uh, statements like this for a fixed x that there are infinitely many finite graphs g covered by x whose second eigenvalue is smaller than some number rho star. Hopefully smaller, which in turn is hopefully smaller than this lambda 1 of g. And before we ask about that, let's ask ourselves, what is the best rho star that you could potentially put here? And that's the subject of a well-known theorem by Alon and Bapana, and generalized by Gregorchuk and Zuck, among lots of others, uh, which says that you could not possibly put anything smaller here than the spectral radius of the infinite graph, the maximum eigenvalue of the infinite graph. Uh, so that's a barrier to how low these second eigenvalues can be. And in the classic case that was studied by Lone and Bapana originally, uh, that was when the infinite graph is just the delta regular tree and the finite quotients are all the delta regular graphs. And it's well known that the spectral radius of this delta regular infinite tree is this particular number, 2 root delta minus 1. And so the Lone and Bapana theorem in that case says that if you have any n vertex delta regular graph, its second eigenvalue is at least 2 times root delta minus 1 minus the low of one. Okay, so you can't possibly hope that your second eigenvalues are below this, really. Can you define spectral radius? Uh, spectral radius uh, for a finite graph is like the maximum magnitude of the eigenvalues. For an infinite graph, I guess you have to take more care. Um, yeah. Yeah. Vertices. Yeah. Yeah. But for example, eventually the way we'll deal with it is uh, like if I'm not uh, make, missing a hypothesis or anything, it's like you look at how many length uh, closed walks there are in the infinite graph of length k from a worst starting vertex, and like if that scales is like c to the k, then the spectral radius is C. Uh, good. In fact, uh, others, including Sayre, showed that actually for any k, like 10 or 100, uh, even the 100th eigenvalue of g has to be at least this number, minus little of 1. Um, in fact, this is true even for like a constant fraction of n. But I won't get too excited about this and mainly just remember this fact that the second eigenvalue basically has to be at least the spectral radius of T sub delta, and in general, as was proven by Gregor Chuck and Zuck, it has to be at least the spectral radius of uh, the infinite graph x, or any infinite graph x that covers g. OK, so let's go back to the simpler alone Bapana statement for a second. Um, OK, so motivated by this, there's a traditional definition of what it means for a graph G, a finite graph, to be Ramanujan. So if you have a delta regular graph G, it's said to be Ramanujan if its second uh, eigenvalue is at most 2 root delta minus 1. And then you may say it's like an optimal spectral expander. So that's a cool object to have if you can get it. Uh, good, so let me store that up here. And this will be a uh, main definition for us that, in general, if you have like an infinite graph X, We'll say a, a, a finite graph G covered by it is x Ramanujan if its second eigenvalue is at most the spectral radius of x, which is basically the, the smallest you could hope for. OK, so Peter and uh, Lubotsky and Phillips and Margulis in 1988 uh, showed that when the x is the infinite delta regular tree, there are infinitely many uh, x, regular, x Ramanujan graphs. Uh, at least one delta minus one is a prime. So it constructed infinitely many delta regular graphs whose second eigenvalue is bounded by 2 root delta minus 1. So that was awesome. And then uh, this is extended to this being a prime power by Morgenstern in 94. And then it was just extended to all delta uh, in 2015 by Marcus Spielman and Srivastava using a new method called the interlacing polynomials method. It's going to play a role in our talk today. <laughs> 
OK, so uh, they proved it um, for the usual Ramanujan graphs, delta regular graphs. And they also stated it for bipartite uh, um, graphs. But actually, if you look carefully, I mean, they say in their paper, but they don't make a big deal of it. They do it for actually any um, infinite tree x, well, any infinite tree that uh, covers at least one graph. Uh, so in particular, they, they show actually if x is, they show a bit of a subtle thing. They show that if x is any uh, infinite tree, and g0 is some finite graph covered by this tree, um, then there are infinitely many lifts, g of g0. And these lifts are like you know, bigger graphs constructed in a way that I will describe from uh, g0. They're bigger finite graphs. And they have the property that they're also all covered by this tree x. There are infinitely many such uh, lifts g for which a good thing happens for the eigenvalues. Specifically, it's not hard to show that the eigenvalues of these lifted graph g's uh, contain the eigenvalues of the original base graph g0 plus some more new eigenvalues. And they show you can find these lifts where all the new eigenvalues are bounded by the spectral radius of x. Uh, this proves conjectures of Bilu Lineal and um, Pete Clark. And uh, in particular, that means if your, your, your base graph, g0, is itself x Ramanujan, meaning like for this tree x, meaning that other than its uh, trivial first eigenvalue, all its eigenvalues are smaller than the spectral radius of x, then you know, that guy's good. And then all the lifts will also be good. So all the additional, all these infinitely many lifts g will also be Ramanujan. And that, uh, you know, there's, uh, there is a base graph that's uh, Ramanujan for like the, the delta regular case. Just take a complete delta plus one uh, vertex graph. Also for the bipartite case. So that's good. And even if you like don't find like a graph that a finite graph g0 where the second eigenvalue is smaller than the desired spectral radius, which can happen actually, but if you even if you don't find one, okay, fine. It's just some finite graph. It has like you know ten vertices, so it has ten eigenvalues, and maybe some of them are like bad, bigger than your spectral radius. But then when you do all these lifts, like all the new eigenvalues will be below your goal row of x, the spectral radius of x. So it's you know except for ten eigenvalues. All the eigenvalues are at most the spectral radius, uh, instead of it, the traditional except for one eigenvalue statement. And Clark called these, uh, you know, if they're k zero bad guys, he called them quasi Ramanujan graphs. I'm not tell. I, he didn't mention Bilu and Lineal in his uh, writings, and he made um, a conjecture that was sort of stronger, in that it was about all universal cover trees, and it was not just about two lifts, but it was also maybe weaker in some ways. So the, I think they were independent. Good. So uh, basically, we're going to prove this, but not just for infinite trees, for some kind of wide variety of non-tree infinite graphs. OK, so this is our theorem. Uh, it's, our theorem is that exactly this same thing holds uh, for any uh, infinite graph x, which is an additive product graph. What's that? I will define it. Uh, so all the like eight infinite graphs I showed at the beginning are examples. Sorry, any free product. Uh, it's I'm not uh, any free product of vertex transitive rooted graphs is I think uh, yeah is uh, an additive uh, product graph. Um, yeah. Good. So you know some some new examples of this phenomenon. OK, so yeah, now I'll get into what is this additive product graph and also what are these lifts. So the thing is, you cannot use the, you know, the, the lifts that, you know, if you know about them, that like Bilu and Lineal talked about and the general lifts. Because if you take a base graph and like do these lifts, you know, the, these large graphs that you get will locally resemble trees. But we don't want them to resemble trees. If x, this big infinite graph x is not a tree, then we, it's, we don't want it to resemble a tree. So we need to invent a new kind of lift. Um, so we do, and we call it additive lifts. So I'll first say what is an additive lift. OK. And uh, usually in, in this talk, you know, when you do an additive lift, you usually do a random additive lift. So I'll kind of at the same time describe what is a random additive lift. OK, so one difference from lifts is like you don't just lift one base graph. You lift a collection of base graphs. And I call these the atom graphs. And I'll denote them a1 through ac. And uh, they're on the same vertex set. And I will always like indicate them by colors. Okay, so you'll be lifting uh, collectively like C atom graphs that sit on the same vertex set. 
Here's an example. Here there are four atom graphs, A1, A2, A3, A4, on the same vertex set, U, V, and W. This is a triangle. These three are single edges. They don't have to be connected. So I'm going to describe how you like make an additive lift out of these four base graphs. So uh, the definition of an additive lift involves two operations. You first do one operation and then another operation and combine them. So I'll now say what those two operations are. First operation is simple. It's summing. So summing some graphs that are on the same vertex set, you just sum the adjacency matrix. You just put them on top of each other. OK, so in this particular case, summing these atoms gives you this graph, like the triangle where everything has two parallel edges. And you should think of this as just a normal graph. I mean, I drew the colors of the edges just to remind you where it came from. But you know, it's just a normal graph, well, with parallel edges, potentially. OK, that's one simple operation, summing graphs in the same vertex set. Now I'll tell you like the more important operation, uh, which is about balanced lifting. So this operation of balanced lifting applies to single atoms. Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to do balance, a balanced lift to each of the atoms and then sum the results together. So let me just tell you what is the balanced lift of a single graph, by example, with this triangle. And, uh, a balanced lift is actually a special case of the usual kind of lift, as we'll see. Uh, if, you, if you don't know what that is, you'll, you'll know at the end of this explanation. So uh, I'll tell you how to make a balanced R-fold lift where R is any param integer parameter that you want. And uh, here's how it goes. So you start with your graph and your parameter R. And as normally in lifts, you make R copies of each vertex. So in this example, R is 4. So here's like 4 copies of the 3 vertex set. Okay, and then you're going to put some edges in here. Okay, how do you do that? Uh, you pick a random permutation, pi sub u, for each vertex u. And this is where it gets different from the usual graph, where you pick random permutations for the edges. You pick a random permutation, if you're doing a random uh, balanced lift, pi of u for each uh, vertex, where it's from the, the symmetric group SR, where if you're doing like, in this case, R is 4, you pick a, uh, a permutation of four things. I'll get to that. Hall put Yeah, because they defined our problem. They prove the end of the Yes, and we definitely follow that paper. I mean, yeah, it's we're riffing on that paper, among other things. Good. Uh, so by example, like I picked these three permutations for the three vertices from S4. Okay, and now you put um, permutations on edges, but uh, you put on the UV edge, you put the quotient of the permutation for the vertices, like pi V inverse times pi U. Okay, so now once I, I did that here, um, these are the quotients. And now you have like a permutation on each edge, but there's a special property, which is that actually in your base graph, if you go around any cycle, well, here the graph is just consists of one cycle. But anyway, in general, if you go around any cycle, like it'll cancel in such a way that the product will be the identity permutation around any cycle. That's the balanced prop property. OK, so you pick these like balanced permutations for the edges in this way. And then you do the normal lifting thing, which is to say you put a perfect matching between the u vertices and the v vertices according to this permutation, and similarly for every edge. OK, so. This is a disgusting picture. You can't really tell what's going on, but I, I think I, I did it correctly. Um, and let me make one remark here, uh, which is that, oops, uh, if I can make this remark appear. Um, this actually looks a bit trivial because uh, I'll tell you, this actually results in our disjoint copies of the base graph. Basically, because, like, you know, as you go around this cycle here, like you come back, you follow a cycle up here too. So you get like in this particular case, like you get four triangles here defined in this way. So it looks like very ungeneral, but it's going to generalize the usual lifts eventually. So actually, let me stretch this out so it's a little bit clearer, moderately clearer. So uh, here's like one triangle. This, is, this edge is not going through this vertex. It's just a coincidence. It's going between v3 and w4. And then here's another triangle, and here's another triangle, and it's tripartite, like it's always a U, V, and W triangle, and there's another triangle. Okay, so that's what happens when you do a balanced lift. So that's the, the graph in this example. Uh, okay, 
Now, finally, I I'm now defi finishing defining uh, additive lifts. If you have your four atoms, what do you do? You do a random, if you're doing it randomly, additive uh, R fold lift this way. You do a random balanced lift for each of the atoms, and then you sum them. OK, so you, you know, if it's R is 4, you make these four disjoint triangles, four disjoint edges, four disjoint edges, four disjoint edges in this permutation-based way. And you sum the results. So here's a picture. Here's the lift of the balanced lift of the triangles. Here's the balanced lift of the pink edges, of the green edges, of the blue edges. And then finally, you sum them. That's the final graph. Okay, so this is a balanced four lift, sorry, an additive four lift of my four atoms, a triangle and three edges. Uh, on this subject, while I'm here, let me go back a little bit. Um, if your graph consists of a single edge, or actually, if more generally, it consists of a tree, then a balanced lift is the same as a lift. Right? Because although you're choosing the edge permutations in this way defined from the vertices, like you actually end up just getting like independent permutations for each edge. Because once you fix a root, like if everything else is random, you just get random uh, permutations. So a balanced lift of a tree, a graph with no cycles, is just the same as a lift. But like if there's cycles in your base graph, then there'll be like analogous cycles in your, your balanced lifted graph. Okay. So that was a side note just about balanced lifts. And now I'll show you the picture of the full additive lift. OK, so this is an example of a fourfold additive lift of the triangle together with three edges, those four atoms. Here's like a bigger example. This is, I didn't show the tripartite structure here, but this is a tenfold lift of that case, of the, th the, tri the yellow triangle and then the three single edges. And now maybe it's a little easier to see the structure. So you see like the, the tenfold lift here consists of like 10 yellow triangles. What's going on here is there's actually a parallel edge. So like the computer drew the green one on top of the yellow one. Um, you have these 10 disjoint triangles, and then like at each vertex, uh, you have like a pink edge and a blue edge coming out, or like a blue edge and a pink edge coming out, et cetera. So it looks like um, you know, this degree four graph in which every vertex participates in a triangle. OK, so this is a way to generate um, non-tree-like or non-locally tree-resembling uh, big graphs from some base graphs. Uh, and let me tell you that it actually generalizes the usual notion of lifts as follows. Let's say you have just like a generic single graph, like this generic graph. What you should always do when you have like one generic graph is think of it as the, if it has C edges, think of it as the sum graph of C atoms, each of which is a single edge. So take the graph and for each edge, just make like an atom out of it. Okay. And now, um, oh, I don't have a picture illustrating this. Well, now, if you do this uh, R-fold additive lift to these collection of edges, it's exactly like the usual lift, right? Like each of these turns into like uh, just a perfect matching, a random perfect matching in the lifted graph. And then you put them all back together again. OK, so if you treat like a generic graph as like a sum of edge atoms, then like these additive lifts generalize the usual lift. Uh, OK, so here is back to our picture. These are our four atoms. This is a fourfold additive lift. This is a tenfold additive lift. Now let's ask this question. Imagine you fix your atoms and you let R go to infinity and you look at like a random R fold lift, which this will start to resemble or like locally resemble a certain infinite graph. Which infinite graph? This graph. By definition of this graph. Okay, so I'm like, this is not really a proper definition, but this is my definition or an illustrating definition of what is the additive product graph of these four atoms, which I denote with this in tech, this is slash plus circ. I had to find some symbol. So for any you know atoms, this is an infinite graph. I'll show you a picture in a second, uh, called the additive product of these atoms. And it's that infinite graph which all of these additive lifts locally resemble or are quotients of. So you could write. You can't describe this in terms of variety of some graph that has only universal coverage and intermediate cover. It, by, uh, it's a, yeah, I mean, you can describe it simply and like, you know, algebraically. It's similar to the definition of a universal covering tree, except with. No, no, so there are all these intermediate covers. Ah. Which in the double cover, you, you uh, take an abelian cover. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Well, some intermediate cover, actually, the universal cover, but you've got it also. Yes, and yes. An infinite cover, but which is a quotient of the universal cover, but somewhere in between. Yes, so I would guess. yes, that sounds right, yeah. Um, so we, I mean, you know, not an expert on these sort of things. When we define it, we just, uh, you know, we give a proper definition, but just basically, if you were to define the universal covering tree by like just telling the construction of it, then we define this in the same way by telling the construction of it. Uh, so in particular, this infinite graph is the, this guy. And again, I'm not going to like define it because I don't want to take the time. But how do, you, how do you get it, the infinite graph? This is an infinite graph. I've shown a piece of it. You, you know, start with actually any atom, let's say the triangle, and you plunk it down. And then for every vertex, you attach all the other atoms to it if they are connected to that vertex. Like, but you always attach with the vertex identity. So like here, u in the other three atoms is connected to an edge in A2 and, and also A4. So you put down a pink and a blue. And then basically, you recursively do this. So I won't write a definition, but it's like this. Yeah. Does it act with finite in any orbit? Uh, you know, a well trained mathematician could probably answer that. I'm, I'm expecting the answer is yes. But yeah. Yeah. If I had your thing, not every point looks like every other point, but I think the quotient. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, but like every u vertex looks like every other u vertex, yes, and every v so vertex. There's a group, the, the group of uh, graph isomorphisms of the infinite object, the quotient is, is finite, finite, yes. And um, I'll just do a couple more examples by a picture. If we have these as our two atoms, like the infinite, uh, their, their additive product looks like this. I mean, this is a piece of it, but you, know, you plunk down the yellow guy and then attach the pink guys at all the vertices. And then you attach the yellow guys at all those untouched vertices and so forth. Uh, also, if you have just like one graph and you do this standard move of viewing it as the sum of its edge atoms, and then you do the additive products of those, you get the universal cover tree of the original graph. So this operation kind of also generalizes like the universal cover tree object. And uh, just one more example to have a picture, like this three, four cycles looks like this. So these are vertex transitive graphs. And in that case, it looks like the free product of these <coughs> graphs, the additive product. And uh, by design, like the whole point of this is that every additive, finite additive lift of these three guys, this you know, balanced lifting thing, is covered by the infinite additive product graph. I mean, it's in the finite quotients of this thing. There's a tiny asterisk here because, like, by definition of being a quotient, like the finite graph should be connected. But ignore that; it's going to be connected most of the time in in applications. I mean, the whole point will be to construct these finite graphs whose second eigenvalue is bounded away from the first eigenvalue. That automatically makes the graph connected. So, basically, ignore this asterisk. Good. So now we're happy because, like, any infinite graph that is itself like you know, one of these additive products, you know, these nice graphs of which I've been drawing you pictures. We have a method for, we automatically have a method for generating like arbitrarily large finite quotients of a finite graphs that locally resemble it. Um, good. Okay, so time to talk about eigenvalues, right? I mean, the whole point was we were looking for like, for a fixed infinite graph, like infinitely many finite graphs that locally resemble it, that are quotients of it. Um, but that have small, whatever, second eigenvalue. OK, so what's going on with these eigenvalues of an additive lift, G, of some atoms, A1 through AC? Well, like in the usual case, you always retain the eigenvalues of just the sum of these guys, the graph you get by stacking the atoms on top of each other, which is also like the one-fold additive, additive lift of them. Plus, you get some new eigenvalues. Okay, so you always start with some finite set of eigenvalues, but then as you lift bigger and bigger, I mean, you get new eigenvalues. 
And you know, your life dream would be that for, let's say, a random additive lift of the type I've described, that let's say with high probability, all of the new eigenvalues you get, aside from these ones that you're surely going to have, are smaller than the spectral radius of your infinite, your associated infinite graph, the additive product. And if you had that, then I would imply our theorem that for any infinite graph, which is one of these additive products, there are infinitely many, well, quasi x Ramanujan graphs, meaning if you're allowed to ignore like potentially the finitely many bad eigenvalues that you had in your original sum graph, uh, then it would be Ramanujan. And if you like, you know, luckily enough, you like just discovered that the sum graph itself, other than its trivial first eigenvalue, Do it's other. Have an example where you don't have a starting uh, I believe actually for finite, uh, for for example, for free products of uh, vertex transitive graphs, or free products of Cayley, Cayley graphs, um, I think there's always a starting graph. Yeah, right. So I'm asking, do you have an example? There are some. Uh, yeah, because there's this theorem, I think there's this theorem of uh, Lubosky and Nagyna beta that shows there's a tree, in fact, that uh, is a cover tree. It, it has you know, infinitely many quotients, but none of them are uh, Ramanujan. So that, I think that means that, it, that that particular tree they construct has no good starting graph. It may not be, may not be quasi yeah. homogeneous. Yes, it, it's you, not. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, I don't actually know any example where like there definitely isn't one. And you probably have to like write a paper if it's true that there isn't there is an example where there isn't one. You probably have to write a paper like they did to find it. But you know, in our specific case, we actually didn't really get into the question of like, oh, in specific examples, is there actually a starting graph that has the right, to, um, you know, well-bounded eigenvalues? I mean, we checked it in like a few, like for this case, like yes, it works. I mean. And it's, it is a question because you can achieve the same additive product from different starting atoms. It's not like every time you have like a distinct set of atoms, you get a different uh, um, additive product here. So if you have like one additive product in mind, you can like hunt for different atoms whose starting graph has potentially good eigenvalues. But we didn't worry about that too much and just wanted to do this. So that's a dream. Uh, and like in the, if you know these papers by Marcus Spielman and Srivastava, like we don't achieve this dream. But uh, following them, we achieved the weaker but still satisfying dream of showing that this happens with positive probability. In other words, that for every R, uh, there exists an uh, R-fold additive lift of the atoms where the new eigenvalues are all bounded by the spectral radius of this infinite graph. And that's just like in this, their interlacing polynomials papers. Oh, this random additive lift where like the additive lifts are like these finite things where you pick, I mean, the main operation is you give a random permutation to each vertex in each atom. And that induces by quotients random uh, permutations for the edges. And you make the, the, the yeah, balanced lifts in that way. This is just like a silly way to say that, like, you know, there exists one. Yeah. No, I have a bet with Noga alone whether the random graph right. is Ramanujan. Are you telling me that the, ran the, the positive probability, the random graph, is Ramanujan? I don't believe that. Uh, positive probability, I mean, not independent of R. Not like a universal constant. What's R? R is like if you're doing an R fold uh, lift. No, no, no. I'm not telling you that, of course, yeah. Well, they have three regular graphs. Yep. And I ask, what's the probability of it being Ramanujan? Uh, we're not asking that model of random to regular graphs. Okay. We're asking the model where you fix a base, in the, in the lifting world, you fix a base graph and then make a random R lift of it. Yeah, uh, okay, then you've got to do a repeated thing, saying that. Well, we, we do this like whole Purusawan thing where like you don't actually have to repeat. You can just say like, you start with like a five vertex graph, you'll say like, I'm going to do a 1,000 lift of it and thereby a random one and thereby get like a random 5,000. Yeah, okay, but I understand. But so that number fixed is positive. But if you sort of took large and larger number of vertices, that probability is at zero. Uh, potentially. We certainly don't prove that it's uh, bounded away from okay, zero. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, yeah. no we're not. No, 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 no. We're not making any, fan <laughs> we're not making any fancy statement like that. This is literally. I mean, just uh, this is like a silly way to phrase the fact uh, of the existence fact. 
Although, but, but it's, I say phrase it this way because it's interesting to speculate about whether it holds with positive, like bounded away from zero probability independent of R. Yes, potentially, yeah. And there aren't a whole lot of methods to find things that work like this. Yeah, I mean, that's the craziness of this interlacing polynomials method, that it finds them by this imagining a random process, yet it doesn't find them with high probability. That's very unusual. Uh, so I, I, this paper by Hall, Puder, and Sawin that's came up, it's kind of like, you know these, okay, these Marcus Spielman Srivastava papers are called like interlacing polynomials one, interlacing polynomials two, three, four. I really think of this as like interlacing polynomials five. It's a great paper, and uh, they kind of generalize the stuff in M, uh, the MSS papers. Uh, so like them, we prove this for like you fix the graph and then like take any big R, we prove this statement. But uh, there's not enough time in this talk for me to tell you about that. So I'll do it, I'll just tell you about the interlacing polynomials one method of doing it, which is I'll just focus on two-fold lifts and prove the theorem for that. And then you can still get like arbitrarily you know, large lifts that have the bounded eigenvalues by just repeatedly doing two-fold lifts. So you get this tower, like a sparser you know, density of lifts, but you still get infinitely many. Yeah, quite possibly. Uh, oh, and the proof, yeah, maybe. Uh, well, it depends on the outcome of your bet, right? Uh, OK, so now we're only going to focus on uh, additive, random additive two lifts of a collection of atoms. And uh, like in the regular lifts, like a pleasant thing happens with two lifts. They basically become equivalent to something to do with edge signings, which is like an even simpler concept than lifts. So uh, it's a fact that the new eigenvalues when you do a random additive two lift of a bunch of atoms are distributed the same as the, all the eigenvalues of a random balanced edge signing of the atoms, uh, sum of balanced edge signings. So I'll say what that means. Basically, when you do a, a if you imagine an additive two lift, what do you do? You basically in some way get like, for every edge, either the identity permutation on two elements or the transposition on two elements. And then you make these little uh, two-fold lifts. It's just instead of using identity and the transposition, we'll just use like the real numbers plus and minus. And it's kind of basically the same. So uh, now I'm saying to you, what is uh, the, a balanced edge signing of atoms? And the balance refers to, again, and you don't give like an arbitrary edge signing. It'll have this property that if you take the product of the signs around any cycle, you get one. So how do you do a balanced edge signing of a graph or all the atoms? You do it separately for all the atoms. You just assign a random plus or minus to each vertex preliminarily, and then Finally, for each edge, you put the product of the vertex signs, or the quotient, if you like. So uh, in this way, you get random signs for all the edges, but with a special property, which is the balanced property, which is around any cycle, the product is 1. OK, so it's like some kind of sort of pseudo-random uh, edge signing. And then as before, what we're going to do is like sum these all together and get, oops, get uh, just one graph where the edge edges have, I guess, integer weights, potentially plus or minus, or one. The, the unlabeled ones are weight one. You can also get zero if things cancel. Um, OK, but this is the way in which you can take a bunch of atoms, do a balanced edge signings to them, and then add them all up. And what I'm telling you here is that uh, it suffices to study like what's going on with the eigenvalues of this randomly produced graph. Those eigenvalues have the same distribution as the distribution of the new eigenvalues when you do an additive two lift of the, the atoms. Okay, so now for like the rest of the talk, we're going to like study what happened, what's going on with the eigenvalues of this weighted graph as a function of the atoms. Well, first we should decide what is the adjacency matrix. If we're going to study its eigenvalues, what is the adjacency matrix of this thing? So how do we get it? Well, we, we kind of get it by adding up the adjacency matrices of the atoms. But we have to do this balanced edge signing thing. And how do you get the adjacency matrix of a balanced edge signing? If you think about it for like two seconds, you get it by conjugating the original adjacency matrix by a diagonal matrix of signs, plus or minuses. But if Q is like a matrix with plus or minus ones on the diagonal, which you think of sitting on the vertices, then conjugating by Q gives you 
like this way of getting edge signs. Okay, so this is a random balanced edge signing of A1 and a random balanced edge signing of A2. So we do that for all the atoms and add together the results, and that's the adjacency matrix of the final thing. Okay, so for fixed atoms, A1 through AC, we have to study the eigenvalues of this randomly created matrix. It's kind of like what's going on if you've seen the MSS stuff about like finite free uh, product convolutions. Like they're conjugating by random permutation matrices or random unitary matrices. We're conjugating by like a different family of random unitaries, the sign, diagonal sign matrices. OK, so good. So what we want to show is you know, with positive probability when we do this, if you take at this matrix, look at its eigenvalues, and look at the maximum of these eigenvalues, it's at most the spectral radius of that infinite additive product graph. That's our goal in life. And just uh, instead of writing the eigenvalues of this matrix, I'll write it as the roots of the characteristic polynomial of this matrix. Okay, so. Phi, some people, that's not the greatest choice, but some people use phi for the characteristic polynomial of a matrix. So I will too. I didn't specify the name of the variable here, but there is, it's a univariate polynomial. Okay, so we want to study the maximum root of the characteristic polynomial of this random matrix. And now here, like, you apply all this stuff from the interlacing polynomials method, in particular, like the, the fourth paper in the series and this Hall Puder Sawin paper in the series. And I won't get into that, but uh, if you apply all that machinery and generalize it just a teeny tiny bit, you find that it ultimately suffices to show that this thing is bounded by the spectral radius of the infinite graph. This is the maximum root of the expect expected characteristic polynomial of this matrix. Now, if you've never seen this interlacing polynomials method before, like this would like make no sense to you that like un and understanding this would have anything to do with this. Like here, you pick a random matrix, you look at its maximum root. Here, you like pick a random matrix of the characteristic polynomial. You look at the characteristic polynomial, average those to get a new polynomial, and then look at its maximum root. You know, averaging characteristic polynomials is not clear that's going to help uh, you understand anything. But that's the magic of the interlacing polynomials method. Like all this interlacing happens, and it turns out. That uh, you know, in order to prove this, it suffices to study the maximum root of this expected characteristic polynomial. So you have to take that on faith, and then. Can you write this as a class of polynomial combination? Uh, it's not so easy because, like this, uh, okay. So this um, matrix here, it's not invariant to like unitary conjugations of the A's. So it doesn't merely depend on the roots of the A's. That's what happens in the finite free convolution stuff. It is unitarily invariant to the A's. And so it only depends on the roots. Um, but that doesn't happen for us. So in the first paper, there you would use uh, Lieb Hellman. Yeah. Which you either going to use We're gonna variant of or? We'll generalize it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so we have to study this polynomial and its maximum roots. OK, uh, so we give this polynomial a name. And we're going to call this the additive characteristic polynomial of this list of matrices. And we'll denote it by alpha. Okay, so it's the alpha polynomial. It, it's a univariate polynomial. It's the expected characteristic of this uh, polynomial of this thing. We have to bound its max root. By the way, this is not obvious, but the interlacing polynomial stuff also establishes that this is a real rooted polynomial, which is Surprising, but it's true. So that's good. So now maximum has like a natural meaning. It's the real line to order things. Actually, we don't even need this. I mean, we need this for the interlacing polynomial stuff. But actually, in the rest of the talk, you don't need to know that this has all real roots. It could have n complex roots. Uh, because we're going to actually show that the maximum magnitude root of this polynomial is bound by the spectral radius of that infinite graph. But anyway, it has real roots. So you can just remember that fact if you like. OK, so all right, so now we can sort of pause a little bit. Uh, so this is uh, for a given atoms, A1 through AC. This is the additive characteristic polynomial. And we want to study the maximum magnitude of its roots. To warm up for this alpha polynomial, this uh, additive characteristic polynomial, let's do some very special cases. First of all, imagine that there's only one atom, one uh, A, 
So now we're just taking a, a balance, the uh, edge signing of it, and looking at the characteristics of the polynomial. Well, the characteristic polynomial doesn't matter if you doesn't mind if you conjugate a matrix by a unitary matrix, which a signed diagonal matrix is. So this is just the characteristic polynomial when there's only one atom. Okay. There's another nice special case, which is this. Let's say you have like a fixed small graph G, and you view it as the sum of its edge atom graphs. In that way, we've done several times. So if it has C edges, you get C atoms. What is its additive characteristic polynomial? Well, I'll tell you, you know, when you do a balanced edge signing of a graph with just an edge, one edge, it's the same as just randomly signing the edge. Okay? And so therefore, uh, when you do this, when the A's are all single edges, it's just the same as taking G and giving a truly random edge signing to it. So in this case, the additive characteristic polynomial is just the expected char characteristic polynomial of a truly random edge signing of the graph G. And it's a theorem that this is the so-called matching polynomial of the graph G. So proved by Godsell and Gutman in 81, and it's denoted by mu. It's the expected characteristic polynomial of a random edge signing of a matrix G. So this additive characteristic polynomial kind of generalizes matching polynomials. And um, Correct, yeah. So this is the first step, and then you're going to say something about where the biggest step, and then so you're going to relate the row. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, this is actually a theorem. I mean, it's predicated on the different definition of what is mu, the matching polynomial. Here's the usual definition of the matching polynomial written in a slightly funny way. You don't have to like, pay too much attention to it, but uh, it's basically like a generating function for the matchings in G. So it's a generating function. Uh, where the kth coefficient is, this is also written in a funny way, but it's the, it's the sum over all matchings with k vertices of negative 1 to the power of edges in the matching. I'm aware that you can actually write this in a simpler way than what I've written here, but this is going to generalize better. Basically, up to like some minus sign, it's like the, the generating function for like k vertex matchings in the graph G. And then it's a theorem that it equals this expected characteristic polynomial of a random edge signing of G. And I'm actually going to sketch the proof of that, because it's going to be relevant. So uh, here's the proof. Um, let's say you have the characteristic polynomial of any matrix A. You can ask, what are the coefficients of the characteristic of the polynomial? And it's kind of gross, but you can write it down, and it's this. Uh, you just actually open up the definition with determinants. And the kth coefficient of the, the characteristic polynomial of any matrix is this. You sum over all sets of vertex disjoint directed cycles over, think of it as the complete graph on n vertices, over n vertices that have k vertices, so the k thing, of negative 1 to the number of cycles times the product of the matrix entries around all the cycles. OK, it's some kind of disgusting thing, but you can just write it down, and it's this. Now, we're going to be applying this where A is the random edge signing of the adjacency matrix of G. So if you study that, like all the AIJs will be 0 if it's not an edge, or else it'll be plus or minus 1. But basically, this will always drop out unless uh, these cycles actually appear in the graph G, in which case this will be plus or minus 1. So we're doing that. We get a contribution from each cycle that appears in G. But um, we're also taking, we're like randomly edge signing them and then taking expectations. So if you think about that, it would make you think that like everything should drop out, and you just get 0. Because for like a fixed cycle, like the product in expectation around here will have expectation 0. But aha, it doesn't drop out if the cycle has length 2. Because if you have length 2 cycle, it gets the same sign in a random edge signing. And so it comes together and makes 1. So it does not drop out. And that's why just the two cycles survive, and then you get this. So maybe that went a little fast, but that's how you prove this Gottsville Goodman theorem, Gutman theorem. And uh, I need to say that because we're going to do a little generalization of it. OK, so that's the matching polynomial and uh, why it's equal to the expected characteristic polynomial of a random edge signing of the graph. Uh, OK, 
So now we're studying this expected characteristic polynomial of balanced edge signings of these atoms. You can do all the same thing. And you can show there's like a formula for the polynomial where the kth coefficient looks similar to all this stuff. But what do you sum over? You look at, again, all the disjoint cycles in the sum graph that have k vertices. But just each cycle has to be like monochromatic. It has to come from the same atom. Okay, so like you look at all the cycles in your different atoms, and you can put them together as long as they're vertex disjoint, and then they contribute in this way. Okay, so some kind of generating function for the colored cycles in this story. And uh, yeah, in the case where the atoms are just the edge atoms of G, like the colored cycles, they're only like these two cycles, so. You know, the matchings are like this. I mean, a matching is just when you take disjoint cycles from all the edges of the graph. All right. Uh, so we have these three polynomials, and we know some facts about each of them. And now we want to finally get eigenvalues into the picture. And we're the whole point is we're going to get like a combinatorial interpretation of the eigenvalues for all three of these things. And that will help us understand them. So for characteristic polynomial, it's easy, right? We have this thing, the trace method, that hopefully you all know, which says that for this characteristic polynomial, uh, if you look at the, if it has roots lambda 1 through lambda n, and you look at the kth power sum polynomial of them, this thing, then that has a combinatorial meaning. It's the number of closed length k walks in the graph g. OK, that's the trace method. It's quite easy. So that relates the eigenvalues of this polynomial to something you know, combinatorial about the graph. Now, you prove that easily by like, you know, taking the trace of the kth power of the matrix. But there's also a disgusting way to prove it. If like, the only thing you knew about the characteristic polynomial was this terrible generating function for it, you could still prove this fact using like, generating function stuff. And why? This thing you know, is a generating function for like, disjoint cycles in the graph G. And what does that have to do with closed length k walks? Well, basically, a closed walk is cycles attached in a tree-like fashion. Okay? If you have a closed walk in a graph, you like walk around until you first like revisit a vertex. And then that's like you've made a cycle. And you kind of like pop that cycle off. And then you kind of keep walking around until you revisit another vertex again. You kind of like pop that cycle off. And you keep doing this and you like generate cycles in kind of like a tree-like way. And eventually you close the walk and like that's the last cycle. So you can decompose like any closed walk into this like tree-like you know, collection of cycles. And then, because generating functions, like you can get from here to here. That's obviously an elaborate way to do it, but you know, we have to do that in that way in our more general setting. And that's what the refine hypothesis does. For graphs? For, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, something like this, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know, like Audrey <laughs> Terrace has like this like book about it. I mean, yeah, yeah, like all this, like yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess you can develop it in other generalities. Okay, well, this is actually a different slide from the previous one, but uh, it's the same idea. So Godzilla in '81 proved a combinatorial interpretation for the roots of the matching polynomial, and it's very similar. He showed that the kth power sum of the roots of the matching polynomial is equal to the number of closed k tree-like walks in G, which is a term he defined. But it's a simple term. Like a tree-like walk kind of looks like a depth-first search where you can revisit vertices. Basically, it means like a closed walk where the only way you're allowed to revisit a vertex is by immediate backtracking on an edge. Or without getting into the details, I mean, I just don't want to write like a one-paragraph definition. Um, you know, the reason is, again, the same generating function reasons. Uh, tree-like walks are like edges attached in a tree-like fashion. Okay? In the same way that like here, like all closed walks are like directed cycles attached in a tree-like fashion. So hopefully you can predict the next slide. OK, we do the same thing uh, for the additive characteristic polynomial and give this combinatorial interpretation. And uh, pardon the pun. Uh, the kth power sum of the roots of this thing is the number of free-like walks in the atoms. 
which is a term we invented, uh, where again, I will not define a free like walk just because you know, there's like negative one minutes left and it's like a paragraph. But basically, it's what you get if you attach colored cycles together in a tree like fashion. OK, so what do I mean is, like, again, let's say you have these colored atoms, like five atoms, and you imagine like, making their sum graph. So now you have like one graph, but still think of the edges as colored. And now like, imagine doing closed walks in it. We know that whenever you do a closed walk, you can like, sort of pop off these cycles and think of it as like, cycles attached to it together. And like, that closed walk is free-like if all these cycles have the same color. OK, so some, some sub-collection of the closed walks in the, the, the atoms. It's really the closed walks in the, you know, in this cover. Yes, yes, yes. So that's. Now you've proven the last slide, uh, basically. Good. So, good. So just accept that you pretend you know what this definition of free-like walks is. Okay. So we're almost done. So therefore, like, if you want to understand what is the maximum of these roots, just think of these as like fixed finite size objects, and then like let k grow very large. Actually, I've chosen it to be even for some boring reason. Then you know the power sum will be dominated by like, the largest magnitude of the roots to the power of 2 to the k. OK, if, if you remember that the roots are real valued, otherwise it's at most this. But anyway, the, the maximum magnitude of this polynomial is that number L, such that the number of closed length 2k free-like walks scales like L to the 2k. So that's how we get a handle on the maximum eigenvalue of this, uh, so the maximum root of this polynomial. Yeah, the thing is, like, I, I'm not good at like poles and generating functions. So, no, like, no, the, yeah. The issue is you don't know, need to know what it is. You just need to know the true growth rate. Yeah, exactly. So, like, in other words, you don't know how to compute the spectrum on the cover. Yeah, exactly. So, like, all this stuff, I mean, that you know, is is done in these attempts to, well, you know, compute the spectrum in some cases and like the formulas for the finite free convolutions. I mean, yeah, it's it's poles and generating functions. But this is, I don't know, somehow I, I was. Able to understand it. It's like it's, it's, it's easier you way to. Don't need to know what that is. Yeah, exactly. You just need to know how to compare them. Exactly. At this point, you have the, the t walks that are doing the count are the ones that exist exactly. only on this cover. Exactly. So that's indeed the end of this slide. Um, so remember, our goal was to show that the maximum magnitude root of this polynomial is at most the spectral radius of this infinite graph. OK, so now here's the only part where you need to know what does it mean, the spectral radius of this graph. It's that number r such that the number of, it's like, imagine doing the trace method, if you will, on this infinite graph. You get this fact, that it's that number r such that the number of closed length 2k walks in this graph, whatever it is, from the worst starting vertex, scales like r to the 2k. And this statement has nothing to do with this being an additive product graph. I mean, it's for any infinite graph. And uh, so um, we want to show that l is less than or equal to r. So it suffices to show that distinct closed free-like walks among the AIs correspond to distinct closed walks, like normal closed walks in the infinite graph. And that's obvious from the definitions, except I didn't write the definition for either of these things. <laughs> but had I written them, it would become obvious. It's like Peter was saying. Uh, so uh, in fact, these are the requisite pictures. This is the, the sum of the things. You can imagine free like walks here versus closed walk here. But I'll just end the talk here. Thanks.